So how do you want to start? <laughs> uh, good question. You know, I like this expression, lady first. Uh, Donna Michaela. Hmm, that's what you use when things are a little bit delicate, right? <laughs> lady first. Okay. So, first of all, uh, it's a great uh, honor to talk with Tom, with Oliver also, but we haven't heard about him before, but with you, Tom, oh, you know, this really does feel like virtual reality to be speaking with somebody you've been following for some years. So we are both very honored and excited and a little bit nervous about today, <laughs> like little kids talking with somebody important. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let that idea go. That's uh, yes. not, not the way it is. I know, I know, but sharing it <clears throat> made it let go, made it go away. Um, then uh, we would like to explain very very briefly and then leave room for questions and answers we would like to explain very very briefly uh, the story of infovision because you know one part of it which is the the seeing without eyes mm -hmm. that is only one component of the big story <clears throat> called infovision or the way mark copyrighted it uh, the activation of the center of direct information perception in the human brain. Whether it's in the brain or somewhere else is not that relevant, but it had to be located somehow. <laughs> um, and uh, we are very passionate about uh, this story, which is um, growing and evolving and branching out uh, faster and faster. It started with one idea that Mark had, which was if we can see without eyes, then the blind can see. So he started off with that one particular idea 20 years ago. And he tried it out with some blind children. And it worked, of course, slowly because he was just then trying things out and creating a hypothesis of how this might be possible and uh, what would happen and whatever he thought of uh, back then. Then he thought, why wouldn't I do it with sighted kids as well? It may be interesting. Not really knowing, maybe just intuiting, but not really knowing what he would get. And what he got was very interesting feedback from the parents who started uh, to say that, you know, my kid was kind of aggressive. Now he's decent and reasonable. Or my kid was the poorest in the class. Now he's getting to the top. Or he was this or she was that or whatever. Mm -hmm passive and all sorts of, you know, issues that we all have. Uh, and these issues somehow, naturally, without Mark doing anything specifically, uh, they would uh, disappear or improved at least. Sure. So that uh, got Mark thinking that, oh, that this is maybe something more than just this interesting ability that we mm -hmm. can see without eyes. And then he figured out a way to uh, address, to, to offer this uh, ability to the adults as well. Uh, designing, of course, a totally different methodology. We all know why <laughs> this different methodology is needed. Um, and then developing and branching out even the also this um, teaching for adults. It started with the, what we call direct knowing. What people normally call intuition, we call it direct knowing. And we can explain that if uh, it's interesting. Uh, and then 
only some years later, he also found a way to design a methodology to work with adults uh, with the mask to, to see without eyes. And um, five years ago, I joined InfraVision as a student, of course, first, and then as a trainer. And I got very passionate about uh, the seeing without eyes component. I'm using the direct knowing constantly in everything that I do. But for teaching, I got passionate about the mask. Um, and from there, another branch uh, came into existence, which is the so-called therapeutical, uh, therapeutic branch. I don't like to call it therapeutic, really, because I don't do any healing. Somehow it gets done uh, by itself. I'm there just to direct a little bit things, to observe some things and to know to guide more to the left or more to mm -hmm. the right or talk to the parents or really just uh, guidance. And um, briefly, that would be it. We changed a lot of things in time, improved methodology, um, both to adjust the mindset, the beliefs, and so on, but also the changes that are happening in the mindset itself. The students we have now are very, very different from the students we had five years ago, and even more different from those that we had 10 years or 20 years ago. Oh, how are they different? They are much more open, much faster, um, they know already, at least intellectually, but also experientially, um, much more things than they would 20 years ago. Um, they are more eager to learn. Uh, they are less resistant. This is something I really like. This is the best mm -hmm. indicator. They are less resistant. Um, and... Um, they enjoy more. They are fascinated and they can correlate with other experience, with other methods that they've been experimenting with or really get proficient <laughs> in some other method. And uh, one other thing that I like, um, people already doing for years some specific method are very interested in broadening their experience with our method and with other method, they understand that the the background is the same. Sure. It's just various sure. manifestations, various representations, various roots, if you will, all leading to the same thing. Sure. Sure. You could just as easily do hearing without ears. It would it would work just as well. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so okay. how old are these students uh, that you, you see now that are more open? Uh, what, what ages are we talking about? I would say um, over 45 years old. They are the, more, the most open somehow, more than the young ones, probably because of the intellectual knowledge, at least. Mm -hmm. So they are very receptive to explanations. And then they know already that if they have to struggle, then it's their own mind, their own beliefs blocking mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So they work on them themselves rather than with the young ones. They don't know these things. So they are still... Uh, not flexible anymore as teenagers, but not wise or not experienced enough as the older ones. So they are the most difficult, mm -hmm. probably counterintuitive. No, I would, I would think that's the way it should be. Yeah. yeah. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. 
Mark, if you I'm want okay. anything to this. Yes, I want to say something. Yes, I First of all, uh, yes, to introduce myself and Michaela. Uh, we are not uh, specialists in the brain, all of this psychology, blah, blah, blah. It was before. I'm chemical engineer and Michaela professionally interpreter. She had a high degree as a humanitarian. But what I uh, like different between me and Michaela, uh, you know, I cannot work with something that I don't have explanation. And if it's no scientific explanation or any other kind of explanation, I create it. If it's logically for me, I follow it. Michaela <clears throat> accepts my way, but she goes to try to find explanation, not as a my fantasy, but find some scientific searching so that I respect her very much. And many of my crazy ideas, she tried to put it on a land and explain it. You know, what, what do you mean as a crazy idea? <clears throat> the, very often uh, people ask and continue to ask me, is it possible if we don't use our eyes, can we see in the darkness? And my answer was completely no, because what does it mean to see? To see, to have visual images. Visual images, it's energy that energy on photons, and this, when this uh, photons light come to our eyes, our retina react, make some movement of this stuff, and we received visual image in our uh, brain. If it's no light, what kind of images are you going to receive? It's completely wrong. And I'm saying, in the darkness, we cannot see it. <laughs> Michaela has, has some another way. She said to me, Mark, we cannot see because these visual images cannot transfer to our brain by photons. Yes, in the darkness, we don't know how photons. But we have infrared. Why you cannot see in infrared? And for me, it's a pushing me. I said, oh my God, she's right. Uh, we cannot see in infrared because it's not enough to receive visual information. Doesn't matter. It's a light visual information, infrared vision information. When we are born, we can see nothing. Visual information comes to us, but we don't have base of visual images. And we cannot recognize this information. So, it's supposed to be the same. We don't have uh, visual images in infrared. But who can say to us, don't create it? Yes, if we create this base of visual images in infrared, we can see in the darkness. Okay, let's try it. We take absolutely a uh, dark room. Michaela has torch with infrared, so she take the mask, and I took with me orange and banana, and this torch. So I try to myself with open eyes. When I put this uh, torch in my eyes, I see red point. But if I take it a little bit far from me, I lose it. She was in a, uh, in a mask, so she did not use her eyes. And she could see this red point from the quite long distance. Okay, I take the <coughs> orange, put this infrared torch light to the orange. I said to Michaela, that is orange, that is banana, that is orange, that is banana. We create uh, visual images in infrared. And maybe in five, ten minutes, I ask you now, I believe that you have two images in infrared. Let's Say me, what is this? Orange? Good. That is banana. That is banana. That is orange. That is banana. That is... I'm a bad guy. I'm always trying to make some tricky. Before, I uh, show her banana in this way. Now, I put banana opposite way. It's another image. So, I ask Mikhail, what is this? And she said, that is banana. But before, it was like a smile. Now, you put it opposite direction. After this, I say, yes, it's possible to teach people to see in, uh, in the darkness. But question is, what for? Nighttime is supposed to have a rest. Maybe for some special forces of army or something they need. But right now, 
I know that it's possible to see in the darkness. And so, yes, yes. yes and, of uh, course. Seeing without yes. eyes doesn't have anything to do with eyes. Exactly. Doesn't have anything to do with photons. Doesn't yes. have anything to do with light. You don't need light to see, you know, without <laughs> your eyes. It's information. Right. You just exactly. get the information. It's not infrared. It's not visible. It, exactly. You know, if you don't have eyes, you can see without eyes. You know, yeah, it's it's not uh, you know it's not dependent on a physical process. It's dependent on a non-physical process. So we don't need infrared. We don't need ultraviolet. We can see in the dark. We can see what's going on in the backside of the moon. Yeah, we can, we can see what's going on, you know, wherever your intent focuses it, because you're just gathering database information out of a database and you have the intention and you can see it. So it's, yeah, infrared doesn't matter. Ultraviolet light, no light. This room, that room doesn't even have to be this part of the world or even on this planet. You can see just with your mind, with your intent. Yeah. So as you say, with your with your information, you know, you're getting an information and your intent tells you what information you get. And the big thing that blocks it and makes it impossible is that we believe it's impossible. All right. All right. That's the big that's the big block. Yeah. So yeah, that's just the nature of reality. Everything that you're saying, I can I can uh, derive scientifically and logically. Yes, of course it works that way. It has to work that way. And uh, it's you know, perfectly rational to me and scientific for that matter. Exactly. So okay. it's, it's, um, it's not a problem. Now in the bigger picture there, you know, there are problems that are like technical problems and, and we don't have any of those in seeing without eyes. Cause it's not a technical, it's not a material technical process. It's a consciousness process. So it doesn't have to do with having eyes at all don't need anything, but we also can have social problems. And that is that if you were to advertise or to say that um, you can train people to, and, and what, what, other, what other people call that is just remote viewing. They're remotely seeing something. And by remote, what they mean is I'm seeing something without being there. You know, that's what, that's what they call it, remote viewing. So basically you can teach people to remote view. And that's been done now for about the last 50 or 60 years to where there's a lot of good science at remote viewing. A lot of remote viewers have, you know, they, they know how to teach it. They know how to teach other people and they get good at it. They're 85, 95% accurate in all their remote viewing. So it, uh, it works. But what they don't know that you guys, that you guys do is that you can teach remote viewing in real time. Yes. So it's not just a picture like taking a photograph, but it's like being there, you yes. know, and you can you can see what's there. Now, some remote viewers will do that. They won't just get a picture. They'll get a scene where things are going on, where people are moving around. They do that, but they don't really think about how that's different than a picture, you know. So this this concept of remote viewing in real time is a is really a concept that nobody thinks about. It's like a, a concept that nobody pays any attention to. Even the remote viewers who do it don't really notice that they're doing something besides just looking at a picture. They're actually remote viewing in real time. They're seeing what's going on there. But there's a social problem with that that one has to be really careful with. If you let it be known in general, if the general population of the world knows that you can look in and view and see anything anywhere based on your intent, that will create a huge backlash. That will create a huge problem because people will not look at that and say, wow, that's really interesting science. I didn't know we could do that. Let's do some experiments. You know, instead of people getting excited about it, what they will get is fearful about it. What? Somebody can look in and see what I'm doing at any time, you see, now that fear will start to create problems. Because <laughs> when people get fearful, fear is irrational. When they get fearful, they get irrational. And when they get irrational, it's hard to tell what they might do, but usually it's not very pretty. So there's that part of it that you need to be a little 
careful about. Yes, you can remote view in real time if you just know that you can. You know, if you just stop believing that you can't, then uh, and there's a lot of other things you can do. You know, you can you can heal other people with your intent. You can modify people. Now, what happens with what you guys found when you were teaching people to see without eyes and found out that their personalities improved? They got more productive. They got less uh, rambunctious or less rowdy, and they grew up. Basically, it's what happened. They they just grew up. They matured, yeah. and getting out of your intellect, living living in a reality that is not solely intellectually based, is something that will make you grow up. It grows you up. It, we, we humans are very out of balance. We only live in an intellectual space. You know, our world, our reality is, is, is intellectually based. You know, it's what we see and what we feel and what we touch and what we interact out there. That's all there is. And that's way out of balance. There's another side of us, which is the consciousness side, or as you say, the information side. I would agree with that. That's a good term. Yeah. And we ignore that. We don't develop the intuitive side. Matter of fact, we do the opposite. We say the intuitive side doesn't exist. You know, it's not, it's not real. You can't depend on it. So, in, you know, the average person has spent 20 or 30 years developing their intellectual side. That's what school is all about, developing mm -hmm. your intellectual side. And they spend zero, zero years developing their intuitive side. You know, so they're way out of balance. And it, um, when you teach people, to become more intuitive, when you teach them to, to gather that information that's available, that knowing, and to make that reliable enough that you can depend on it, and it becomes a, a part of your reality, just like the intellectual side does, that makes people grow up. They become more balanced human beings. They see the world in a different light now. They see themselves in context with that world in a different way than they did before. Suddenly, they're not just this little player in a material world doing material things that don't often make sense. So they can be rowdy and they can be annoying because, you know, the whole thing seems like it just isn't that important or significant. But once they get that intuitive side, they start seeing themselves as a part of the whole. See? I'm connected to everything. I'm mm -hmm. a part of the whole here. And it just changes their attitude immensely to the point that they start to mature. They start to grow up some. So they're not so out of balance anymore. They're not as self-centered anymore because they feel connected to other people, to other things. Because not only can you, can you see what's there, but you can feel what other people are feeling. You can taste what other people are eating. Yeah. You know, you can, you know, you're connected in this world in a very fundamental way. And that's humbling in the sense that you become one of something much larger than just yourself. We're all interconnected. So just that realization helps people grow up, helps them you know, see themselves in a more profound and a more serious light. Yeah. Well, and I think that's why that works. And that's why those people are growing up for you because, and that's a good thing. If people were more balanced, we wouldn't have all the nastiness in the world that we've got today. It's mm -hmm. mostly because we're so out of balance that we get that. It's hard, very hard for us to grow up and mature when we are so lopsided in our awareness of the reality we live in. Yeah. I think intuition is not being developed for exactly the same reason, which is fear. Because, mm -hmm. yes, it sounds nice that I have intuition about other people, but it may not sound... Uh, um comfortable right that other people also feel me and we all mm -hmm. have this idea that i'm not good mm -hmm. enough so i need to hide this and that about myself and if people would get me the way i am inverted commas which is just a projection generally from parents and society and all that uh, then I don't want them to know me the way I am. But mm -hmm. this works both ways. You cannot have intuition about others, but others not having about you. 
It works mm -hmm. both ways if it does. And right. so hiding ourselves is what blocks our mm -hmm. intuition to work. It would work naturally, I believe, without any seminar, without any mm -hmm. book, without anything, if we would just be brave enough to show ourselves the way we, the, we are, with all mm -hmm. our faults, with all our problems, and you know, being mm -hmm. vulnerable to being exposed, rather than playing hide and seek, generally. Yes, you're yeah. absolutely right. Fear is the problem. Exactly. Again, fear, fear is the root problem. Yes, mm -hmm. that is exactly right. And we we uh, feel very uneasy around people who can, mm -hmm. you know, do paranormal things because we don't know what it is they're knowing about us. We're mm -hmm. not sure about their reality. And it's a little scary. The, the unknown is 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 frightening. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, you know, telepathy is another thing. You can you can understand what people are thinking, what they're feeling. Uh, mm -hmm. Where they are, their background, their history, what leads them to this particular situation. I mean, all of that information is available. Yes. But yes, people are very fearful. Yes. And you have to be careful when you're dealing with fearful people. Because fearful people are dangerous. Fearful <laughs> people can do ugly things. And yes. they are not rational. So you you need to tread carefully if you push too hard against people's fear, they will push back. Yes, and they are more and stronger. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There's a lot more of them. Exactly. Let, let me say something. It's very interesting, this discussion. First of all, I want uh, to make different in term, terminal, terminology. For me, vision and visualization, it's two different abilities. And I am strongly believe that we can receive uh, through remote viewing information about something. But I am against, I can see it. Uh, I explain. <clears throat> For example, I say to you, imagine a red rose. And you imagine it. You received visual image, but it's, you don't receive visual image from a rose. You visualize it. You imagine mm -hmm. this. So, in my mind, when we say that we can see from the distance 100 kilometers, it's not uh, seen in understanding with using our light. It's you receive the information and realize excuse my English, visualize, it. visualize it. In my understanding, uh, we have some special information signal. And uh, our information signal was like visual, hearing, touch, and blah, 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 blah. It's simple. This info signal, it's like a cable, a telephone cable, when it's different uh, wires, different color. Blue color, it's visual information. Red color, it's hearing information. And this, um, our info center can receive this strong uh, complicated information signal and then divided for the different uh, place and it's not just only our regular sense of feeling it will be difficult to believe but trust me I don't make a fantasy uh, 2001 I have a student who could read the information from that time it was no uh, flat st uh, flash stick it was just only um, uh, floppy, disk. floppy disk, yes. And she could take the information from electronic source. I put there some articles, she take it, close her eyes, and without installing the computer, she said, Mark, I uh, go uh, inside this floppy disk, there is five files, five different articles, uh, brain one, brain two, Nikola Tesla, Salkovsky, blah, blah, blah. Which do you want me to read? I said, okay. Read me brain to five, ten minutes more pause, and she start to read like she keep this article in front of her. I ask her, I ask her, can you see it? She said, no. These uh, words come to my brain, and I just verbalize it. So, <clears throat> uh, another, I make some uh, sign for myself. Another question which uh, from time to time our students ask 
us in a seminar. But if uh, somebody, bad boy, bad guy, can uh, have this ability to know everything, how can I care about my credit card? He can receive this information and rob me. I said, no. For me, information is sense of feeling. And our conscience, sub, uh, sense of feelings are subconscious. And conscience cannot uh, make them order to. We cannot order to our eyes not to see. We can ignore information that we receive through the eyes. But say, but say them not to see, we can. Infovision, in my understanding, it's uh, uh, in the same in subconscious. We cannot say, I want to read the information about credit card of this guy. We cannot. But if I forget my information, oh my God, I don't remember. I immediately receive this information. So it's a big difference between my uh, reg, uh, my Need. good wishes, so my needs, yes, and my bad wishes. And about uh, intuition, I ask myself what the difference between infovision and intuition. Intuition, in my mind, uh, we everybody have this info center. But when it's sleeping, we don't use it. We did not activate it. When it's sleeping, some very important information to you come, knock it, but you feel something, but you don't understand what is this, and you start to guess, and you do something, and it's correct, and everybody say, oh, you have a good in uh, intuition. If you make mistake, your intuition is bad. In my mind, <clears throat> intuition cannot be good or bad. Intuition is supposed to be info center and approximately way. We can say that during our seminar, we take intuition from some paranormal abilities to make it normal abilities like a vision, hearing, all of this one. So for me, intuition is not sense of uh, something. It's um, okay. From you know, my English not perfect. It's uh, состояние. Uh, info center. It's how it's info center. If it's sleeping, hmm? sleeping, yes, dormant. If it's sleeping, it's intuition. You are guessing. If it's working, that is info center. And during our seminars, we activate this ability. We wake it up in vision, and we teach our students how to use it. And another interesting question. Uh, I always say that kids are belief and that is give him possibility to learn so fast but it does genes memory they know what is possible but not blah 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 uh, but uh, what my student i like my students ask me mark you know you said that uh, genes memory were well, million years of evolution and we have it in it's in our genes but different between kid and me just only 20 years why my genes memory is working for me and block all of this, but he doesn't. 20 years, it's nothing against million years. Good question. I said to that guy, I cannot give you answer right now, let me see. And my answer was, I try to make it shortly. <clears throat> when we come to this world, in our brain we have some function that analyze information that come to us. That is good for us, that is bad. That is, I can, that is, I can. But when we come to this world, we don't know what is good, what is bad. We're supposed to be uh, teached. And our parents teach us. And right now I'm saying not about human beings. I, I like to say about wolves. In the wolf's family, new guy, wolfy. Baby. So, pardon me? Baby. Baby, yes, I call him wolf. Okay, baby. And uh, his parents teach him, is it possible to eat? That is not possible. That is dangerous for you. That is you can attack. That is you can make this narad, how it's called. Uh, home. Home. home, yes, for you. Home, yes. Let's know. But this function of analysis, it's working. And when this information from the parents of wolf come, brands, brands start to think, is it truth? that it's possible to eat or not. 
Is it true that that is dangerous or not? Blah, blah, blah. But if it will be analyzed without knowledge, his education will be forever and he die without any kind of knowledge. So in my hypothesis, for the period of education, childhood, this function out, close, temporary, and all information that the parents give to the baby, it accept without analyzing. And just only when he become, if she become old enough, and she stop to using, uh, follow the parents, stop to using their ability to understand and uh, make decision what is good, what is bad, he become adult and he leave this family. And at that moment when he become adult, <coughs> this function absolutely necessary to him. Let's turn it back. And, but now he has uh, education, he knows what is good, what is bad, what is uh, healthy, what is not. And uh, for me it's a period of puberty. But the question, another question come to me. We um, divide our students for kids and adults and uh, age, it was approximately 13 years. And the question is, we uh, decided, we have mind, we know, we are thinking about our kids, that they are adults, 18 years old. In America it's 21. Why the big difference between them comes in 13 years old? Where is the logic? Yes, it is logic. Not me, not we are turn off this function. This function turn on our mother nature, mother nature. And for her, our explanation that he is a kid, he's supposed to uh, go to school, go to university, so he is adult in 21. No. For the mother nature, its uh, subject become adult when it can create the new creatures, when it can born. And really, our girls ready to become a mother 12, 13 years old. Boys, 13 years old. And maybe 50, 60,000 years ago, the man, caveman, 13 years old, take the stuff and go to hunt ma mount. And, he's, and she was 13. And he's 13 years uh, cave lady, care about baby and uh, cook this uh, lunch for him for this moment. So uh, the different, if it's not different, border between adults and uh, adults and kids approximately 13 years and we have different different methodology to turn kids uh, not turn i'm extremely sorry to teach kids and teach adults so there are so many interesting information come to you when you are working with this information it push you to think and not say, I don't know and forget about this. Our way, you don't know, but think about this. Create some maybe uh, crazy ideas, crazy hypotheses, but do it. And that is, I like it very much. And uh, I want to finish my speech a little bit more. <clears throat> we have, in the, if we say, uh, the branch of information, two branch. First, we know that until official scientists did not say that infovision, that is a reality, it will be closed many doors, it will be closed possibility to come to the world because, okay, it's something paranormal, it's some uh, sex and uh, nobody knows what, what they are doing. So our first branch to use uh, scientific equipment and find the good uh, guy scientist who can make this. First time I made this search in, in NYU, uh, it was five kids, AG, to see, the idea was to see which uh, part of the brain are working when we are watching the world with open eyes and which part of our brain are working when we are watching the world being blindfolded. It was five kids, I received many papers with all of this diagram and uh, text. The most interesting, the last part of this text, 
just only two phrases, two sentences. First, our equipment show that this uh, student, when he is blindfolded, it's no any kind of visual reaction. As he, Michel, this part. Visual cortex. Visual cortex. Visual cortex, yes. That is first phrase. Another one. But because he called correctly numbers, colors, so he was cheating through the hole in this blindfold. Where is the logic? You say there is no reaction, visual reaction here. If he is cheating, it's supposed to be. Okay, I drop it. I next my experiment uh, we made in the Moscow uh, University. It's a very good. I respect him very much, the Professor Kaplan. It was 11 kids, and we received very interesting information, included that uh, IQ grows up for the kids, alpha uh, ball after the waves go, but it's another story, very interesting. But it showed that retina reacting, and when we talk with professor, uh, follow our agreement, it's supposed to be article in you in the scientist magazines. He said, Mark, you see, Retina is reacting. So all others, uh, all this uh, owner of this scientific magazine say, yeah, retina is reacting. It's a hole here. Okay, we made another. Uh, in Italy, it's very interesting with Professor Elio Conte. And he received that uh, it's no light here, but maybe it's another reason he could not make an article. But we decided, and Again, it was uh, retina reactive. I come to Professor Kaplan and said, Alexander, uh, I don't understand. I'm in the dead end. Hundred thousand percent. It was completely, it was different mask. Uh, different mask. Completely, it's impossible. Why retina is reacting? It's impossible. He said, Mark, you are thinking that possibility to see is one way street. Light come to the eye, retina, and goes to the cortex. But that is too wasty. And you know, for me, like, disappeared darkness. Yes, when we are sleeping, our eyes are closed, but we see dreams, we see visual images. So, it was another point to make another kind of searching. It was ERG, electric retinography and Mikhail was part of this searching and we were sure that here we show that retina not react it was retina reaction and that is Mikhail smart I respect you so much he said Mark uh, you know it's supposed to be different in time of reaction when the retina react receiving the visual image from outside and reaction of retina when it received visual image from outside from infocent we made some pilot yes it is different in the time so that is little genius Michaela and uh, we are going to improve it we want to make strong experience uh, for Time of reaction of retina when we see uh, using our eyes and we receive the visual images through the infravision. We are going to make this experiment. And the last that I say, and I you keep silent that. for a long time. Hmm? You said yes. that twice before. <laughs> the last time. Okay. So, one way, one branch of infravision, it's scientific search to open the door and another branch of information to give it to people he does not need the scientific explanation to the blind to the people with healthy problems so information okay i said <laughs> everything that i want to say maybe a little bit emotionally mm -hmm. but uh, that is all okay when it when it comes to getting hard science done in a subject like this you can do that you can do the hard science you can it's hard to find scientists who are willing to work with you because they feel like it's it's uh, bad for their careers if they're associated with 
pseudoscience and so on. So it's really difficult to get good people to work with you. But it's not impossible. You can find good people who are open-minded and are in science who will work with you. And you can show beyond a shadow of a doubt that what you are saying is true, that indeed something here is going on that is not just the physical situation going on, that this is something that is beyond and outside of the physical realm. In other words, you're, you're getting this information. There's no, there doesn't have to be a physical source for the information. The information just has to exist. There doesn't have to be a transmission from that source of the information to your eyes, to your, you know, uh, visual cortex, that, that's not necessary. You can bypass that. It's not an important thing. And whether the body actually then, you know, like when you dream, your, your eyes are in REM motion. So your eyes are moving around, you know. Well, that doesn't mean that your eyes are seeing the dream. It's, it's not about your eyes, you know, to dream. Your eyes aren't seeing the dream, but your eyes are moving because you're getting information. And that information is interpreted by you as visual information yeah. or, wow. as, or as auditory information. And when you interpret that information as visual, well, there may be this little, you know, bump that you'll get at your eyes just because you've interpreted as visual information. So that doesn't mean that it's, that it's somehow you know, coming through your eyes or that your eyes are actually, uh, you know, seeing things. They're not. They're just wobbling around in there because you're interpreting the data as visual information. But when you get a scientist to do this work and one that's very qualified, you know, PhDs, you know, all that kind of stuff that's very credible and you get them to do it and they take it to their peers and they try to publish papers do you know what will happen? Science will yes. say, nah, never happened, isn't possible, forget it. And that person, indeed's reputation will be tarnished. He won't have credibility anymore. And you will not have gotten one step closer to it. And even if you got 10 scientists and they all agree with the same thing, that this, this strange thing is happening, science in general will ignore it. Science is not the kind of thing that says, oh, here we had a good experiment. Let me check this experiment. Oh, it was done very well. Good protocols, a very actual, you know, a good experiment that was well done, and it showed this. Therefore, that reality must be this way, and now we should explore it because we're scientists and we want to understand the unknown. Science isn't like that. It should be like that, but it's not like that. Science has its own beliefs. Yes. Just like religion, they have their own catechism, they have their own beliefs that they go by. And when what you say is contrary to their beliefs, then what you get is denial. Yes. What I said before is that when you're dealing with fear, fear is irrational. Denial is irrational. Oh, I don't want to go there. There must be something wrong with that experiment. I don't know what it is, okay. but you made a mistake somehow. You must have because you got the wrong answer, you see, because your answer is not the way I believe that it should be. So that's what science will do. There's an organization uh, that, was, that was attached to the engineering department of Princeton University. Now, Princeton University is where Einstein worked. You know, it's not a lightweight university. It's a very big name in, in <laughs> science, and this – it's called Pear Labs. Pear was Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research. And Pear Labs spent about 20 years doing thousands of experiments with immaculate protocols and error analysis and so on, showing that people could affect the physical world with their intent. And they did lots of different experiments, all sorts of experiments. and if you go to, well, Pear Labs tried real hard, and they were PhDs. They were from Princeton with PhDs. They were physicists, and there was a whole group of them there because not the physics department, but the engineering department was shown this anomaly that wasn't supposed to work that way, and it did, and it was repeatable, 
and it was clear there was something there. And the engineer said, well, let's go study that. The physicist said, no, nah, must be something wrong. No point studying that. We already know the answer, you see. So for 20 years, Paralabs, a part of Princeton, has been doing this research. They have tr <coughs> they tried to publish papers in physics journals. Their papers were not accepted because their papers were contrary to scientific belief. <coughs> Fear is an irrational thing. Denial is an irrational thing. <coughs> Eventually, Pair Labs gave up. They don't exist anymore. You can still go to www.paralabs and read their story. <coughs> when they did, <coughs> excuse me, I got a little cough here. I'm going to take a little cough drop. When they did their error analysis, you know, when you do science, <coughs> you do it with statistical analysis of, of the things that you, that you can't control. So you do, <coughs> this is our result, plus or minus a certain thing. And in order to get a result that is, <laughs> acceptable, it has to be statistically significant. In other words, it couldn't have just had to happen by chance. Well, Parin <coughs> Paralabs research has a statistical signal significance, not 100 to 1, which is good, 1,000 to 1, which is very good. They have statistical significance of over a billion to 1. Better science than science has ever done anywhere because they kept, <coughs> they knew people wouldn't believe it, so their protocols were very, very good. <coughs> so a billion to one, statistical significance, and scientists look at it and say, nah, there must be something wrong someplace. They made an error. They had to have made an error because their answer's wrong, you see, and it's wrong because it's not there. So now here is a bunch of Credit, you know, very credentialed PhDs from a very high status university working for 20 years doing the same research. What they did is they approached this, this problem of intent modifying, you know, probability. They, they did this in many, many ways. And the results always kept re reaffirming, you know, what they did. So they did it this way. And they did it some other way. They did it with, you know, all the variables that they could change. And after 20 years, they'd done everything they could do, so they still couldn't publish any papers, and the, the legitimate science still wouldn't pay any attention to them, so they basically quit because it wasn't, they'd already done everything that they could do with it. So that's what happens. What we have to do is get scientists to open their minds a bit to allow bigger pictures to come in. We have to let them understand that their belief in materialism is just a belief, and it's a very limiting belief. And I think that we're, we're making progress on that. I'm hoping within a decade or two, that'll be a fact. Because one thing that is very non-material in its nature is virtual reality, and that's becoming a very big thing in physics departments now all over the world. Because quantum mechanics tells scientists that the world is not materialistic. Because if they, if, they, if they try to do the mathematics that represents a particle, let's say an electron, as a little chunk of mass with charge, they cannot get the right answer. But that's, that's the materialistic electron. If they do the math with an electron that is a point with the attributes of mass and charge, which is a, a simulated electron, if you will, now they can, they can predict correctly the results of experiments. So only when they look at our reality as information rather than as mass can they get the right answer. You see, so the scientists you know, are changing slowly to the idea that materialism isn't right and that it's, this is an information-based reality which is the same as a simulated reality, which is the same as a virtual reality. Okay, now, this, this, I, these ideas you had about, you have different sources, like when you're dreaming, you know, it's not the same as when you're awake. But in my viewpoint, looking at a virtual reality, everything is a data stream. So when we 
when you look at me here, me talking on your on your you know monitor, you know you're getting a data stream, your consciousness getting a data stream, and you interpret it as what you see. That's your interpretation of the data. Okay. Now, data can come from three sources. Data can come from yourself. Your consciousness, you can make up data. Okay, that's when you say, okay, I'm going to visualize a banana. Now I'm going to visualize an apple. All right, you can make that data up by visualizing it. That's the data that comes from within you. But when somebody in another room goes up to a, a stack of books, selects one of them, opens ones up, and says, you know, read what's on this page, you can't make that up because you don't know what's on that page. You're getting information from a source external to you. Now, there is the, the other two sources that you have are external to you. So one is internal. You make it up. Another one is what I call the consciousness system. I call it the larger conscious system, and that's just a metaphor that's the source, the source of the information. So you have the source. And the source in a virtual reality is basically the computer that's computing the virtual reality. That's that's the source of the information that, that describes the virtual reality. Okay, so you have that as the source. Now, when, when you get that information, you interpret it as this reality. All right, I'm sitting here, and I'm seeing you guys on a screen, and... But besides that, I have a chair over here and a, and a curtain behind that and a clock up on the wall. But you don't see any of that because that's not in your data stream. Your data stream is only what you're looking at, you see. Okay, but now that data is still there. What I'm seeing, that clock that's on my wall and those curtains, that data still exists. You don't need, you can't see it with your eyes, but you can see it with your mind. Because it's part of consciousness. It's part of the consciousness system. So you can see that data that your eyes, you know, it's, it's not something that's, that's going to go to your, uh, you're going to see as uh, from, through your eyes. You can close your eyes. You don't have to have eyes. You can be in a dark room. It doesn't matter. You can still see everything that's in this room, right? Because it's information is available, okay? So it's not in your data stream as far as interpreting this, but you can go out as consciousness and collect it and get it. Now, the third way you get data is from somebody else. All consciousness is netted. So we're all connected to each other, consciousness to consciousness. We are, you know, the things, you know, the things that I, that I think and that I feel, as long as when we're in this conversation, you can get some of that not just because you hear me through your headset, but because you're picking up some of it telepathically as we talk. Everybody does this. It's a, it's a normal thing. That's how little children learn language. Yeah. You know, if they had to learn language because, you know, they had to memorize, you know, all, all, the, all the stuff, you know, they, they'd never learn it. They wouldn't start talking at two years old. They learn language because they get a lot of their information intuitively. They know what the parent means, even though they, you know. So children, if you talk to three-year-olds, they know a whole lot more and understand a whole lot more than they have the language ability to communicate. There's much more going on there, much more understanding than what they could ever tell you in language because they're picking up things from, from other consciousness, particularly consciousness that they're close to, that they're connected with, that their intention is focused on, you see. So we have a larger consciousness system. And, okay, if I want to read your credit card, and I say, oh, I'm a little short of money today. I'm going to go read Mark's credit card and charge something to him. Well, that information is available. And theoretically, I can go read your credit card because there it is. It's in the database. But there's a problem with it. This, is, this consciousness system is not just a big machine. The consciousness system is conscious. And the conscious system says, no, that's not allowed. Yeah. You can't have Mark's date on his database because that's just going to create trouble. It's just going to raise the entropy. It's going to create dysfunction in the world if everybody's doing that sort of thing and whatever. It's not allowed. So the system, when you try to read my credit card or I try to read yours, there'll be barriers there. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's impossible if you work really, really hard at it 
Or if you and I agree that it's just a test, I'm going to read your credit card and I'm not really going to charge anything. Well, then it's an easy thing to do. It's like reading anything else. But if my intention is to steal money from you, now it's going to be difficult. Not impossible because the data is there, but it's going to be difficult to do. So it depends on your intent. Yeah. So the system's set up to keep certain things like that from, from being easy to do. It's a lot harder to do that, which means most people will never be able to do that because it's, most people aren't going to develop the skill to that level that they're going to do that. And if you do do things like that, if you do steal people's money and use your, your intent to gather information so you can blackmail people because you saw what they did over there in that room where nobody was, if you use your these abilities that way for negative things, you will eventually undermine your ability to do it because those kind of negative self-serving things will begin to deteriorate your capacity to do that. Yes. So it's, it's self you know, it's self-regulating in that sense that you can get away with some nasty things, but the more you apply that, the less able you are to really do it. And pretty soon you end up in a much worse off spot than you were in before yeah. you tried to steal money. You end up poorer and more destitute than before you tried to rip somebody else's money off by using your intent to collect that data. So that the system's just built that way so that it's self correcting to a large extent. Okay, but there's also this thing that I call the Psi Uncertainty Principle, it's part of my model. And what that is, is that if the the larger you know, population, you know, just the people out there on the street, if most of them really knew and understood that, let's say, they could raise the probability of their boss giving them a raise by using their intent to put that message in mind, in their boss's mind, and that they could use that same idea to, you know, manipulate their children and their wife and their husbands and whatever, that this, you know, they could send messages, they could manipulate that sort of thing. They can, they can manipulate people by making the, giving them headaches or taking their headaches away or saying, oh, if you don't send me money, I'm going to make your children ill, you know, and they can use their mind to make people ill, to make people better. All of that is possible. The nature of consciousness, we can do that, but the system doesn't support it. And as they do that, they start to, to what, to, to dissolve their own ability. And the science certainty principle says that the system will try to make it very difficult for that information to become broadly understood. Okay. So if there's something that, if, if there's something I could do or say that in the weeks following, Almost everybody in the world would understand that you could use your mind to affect people that way. And they really got it to the point that they would go do it and they could do it because everybody can do that. All it needs is, you know, you have to be in the right mental state. You have to get your intellect to shut up a little bit. You need to get in your intuitive state and then you have those abilities. If people really understood that, then I probably wouldn't be allowed to say those things or do those things. Yeah. Exactly. Or something else would come along as soon as I said them, there'd be somebody else would come along and said, oh, that's all nonsense you know, da, 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 to discredit it. Yeah. You know, somehow it wouldn't it, it wouldn't give all these people information. They're not grown up enough to have. You don't give three year olds loaded guns to play with or knives to play with. You have to keep that. So I can freely make hundreds of thousands of hours of videos explaining to people how you can use your mind and all that stuff. But it really doesn't matter because the people who are seeking and trying to grow up and trying to understand reality, they will find it and they will get it and they will use it. The people who know that kind of thing is just stupid. And it's only, uh, you know, it's only people with weak minds that believe that kind of junk. Well, they'll never read it. And if they do read it, they'll throw it away. You know, they won't, they won't process it. They won't put it because they believe that it's not there. So in a certain extent, trying to get this into understand, you know, the science to understand it and say, yes, it's here. To some extent, that has to wait on people growing up enough that they can deal with that information. Otherwise, the system 
is going to suppress it in the sense that the scientists are going to say, yeah, okay, good experiment, but eh, it must be wrong. And they'll just deny it irrationally. Yeah. And you point out the facts and you say, yeah, but look, look, we did this and this and this. What's wrong with that? Tell me where it's wrong. Well, I don't know where it's wrong, but it has to be wrong because, you know, we don't believe in it is what you'll get. And part of that is the fact that we're not ready yet. We're not yet as a people grown up enough where these things are, you know, being available is a good thing. And if you look at most of uh, coastal Africa, you'll find those are places where everybody in those cultures know about mental healing and, and, and being able to uh, cause headaches or, you know, kill someone with your intent or heal them. Everybody knows that that's the way the world works. It's common knowledge. And you have people there who, um, you know, say, you know, give me money or I'll hurt your children. And they, a lot of people there live in fear because there are these bad guys who can, without ever touching you or doing anything illegal, because the law doesn't recognize any of that, they can hurt you and they can terrorize you. And that is a, a very unpleasant place to live because of that. Okay. Now, again, fear is the, is the key. You see, when you're going to, if you want to do, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, I don't know, you know, if you want to do black magic on somebody, you know, if you want to shake somebody down by threatening them, the first thing you have to do is frighten them. Yeah. You see, you frighten them. That's why you send them the little mm -hmm. doll with the pin in it, so it frightens them. That's mm -hmm. why you go on a big rant about how you're going to curse yeah. them and so on, because that frightens them. Yeah. That's the key. Once they're frightened, you open up a channel between you and them, a communication channel. Now you can connect with them and give them headaches. Whereas if they weren't frightened and they said, yeah, oh, give it your best shot, you know, that's stupid, you wouldn't be able to do much to that person because that person wouldn't take in what you were giving them. That person can shut that off if they want. They don't know it, but they can turn that off. But for people who don't understand that they have the power to turn that off, then, you know, and they're frightened, that fear opens the connection between, you know, the victim and the, and, and the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And they can do that, and they can kill your children, and they can you know, make a mess of your life. But first you have to kind of invite them in, if you will, with your fear. Well, when we have a very, very fearful society, that's not good because then a lot of bad things can be done with this knowledge. I think we're going to grow up. And as you say, younger, you know, you, you find that, uh, um, you know, people are more open a little more open-minded. Well, they get more open-minded as they get older because when they, when they're teenagers, they know everything. You know, uh, yeah. you know, t teenagers are in this mindset that that they know almost everything, and they they're not all that open to outside things that contradict what they think they know. By the time you're forty or fifty, you've had some experiences that things have happened that have no reasons to happen, and they did anyway, and that starts to pry your mind open a little bit. And these are the people that you're finding, you know, are, are much easier to, to talk to. But in any case, I think we're going, we're developing. We have all the tools in place now so that in the next couple of decades, we can maybe get to the point where people do have more open minds, where science can make this, a, you know, known all over. Right now, if the science said, yes, it's a fact. We've shown it and it's proved by good science that there is no privacy anymore. Anybody can see anything anywhere. All they have to do is learn how. And hey, guys, it's not even that hard to learn. You know, in a couple of months, you could, you know, anybody could learn this stuff and there is no privacy. Everyone can see everybody else. Yes, guys, you can look in the girls' locker room anytime you want to. Yes, you know, you can follow your husband or wife around all day long and see what they do. You know, all of these things. Well, that wouldn't work now. That wouldn't really be a good thing for science to say, to say at this point. So that's part of the reason why it's just so hard. It's part of the reason that people aren't ready yet 
that's why they're so closed. That's why they say, nah, something wrong with it. You know, can't, can't be right. Even though I can't find anything wrong with your experiments, I can't find anything wrong with your science, it can't possibly be true. Well, part of that is because they're not ready yet to deal with that information being true. They can't deal with it, and it, it makes them fearful. And when they're fearful, they're irrational, and they just say, you know, nope, impossible. I'll just deny it and go on. Yeah. Well, that's not what science is supposed to be about. Right. You know, science yeah. is supposed to be about discovery. And it's very frustrating when you run into this brick wall that science really doesn't want to see the, 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 you know, what, you're, what you have discovered. They're really not interested in your discovery at all. And if you shove it in their face, they'll deny it. So that's kind of that's where we are and some of the reason that we are there. So we have to grow up some. But I believe that the way we'll get there is through physics primarily accepting virtual reality. Because when you accept virtual reality, and I see that coming, because virtual reality is just a growing idea in physics departments, because that's what quantum, quantum mechanics is telling us. It's so, you know, it's, it's really obvious, so it's growing. But when you tell somebody this is a virtual reality, then basically you're saying that, you know, virtual realities, of course, have to be computed outside the virtual reality. You know, the computer that computes the virtual reality can't exist inside the virtual reality. The computer that computes it has to be outside the virtual reality. The player that's playing that avatar has to be outside the virtual reality. So when science says, yep, this is an information computed reality, then the first question is, okay, well, where's the computer? <laughs> and who's the programmer? And, you know, as those questions come up, it's not going to be – those questions aren't questions that, that really belong in physics departments. Those are going to be – you know, a whole lot of people. You know, it's it's philosophy. It's just people who are interested in how the world works. Mm -hmm. It's theology. It's all sorts of people are going to get involved yeah. then. So, you know, right now, physics stays inside the physics department because nobody else really can understand what's going on and nobody really cares because it's so esoteric and so mathematical. But when physics says things like this is a virtual reality, suddenly the world's going to grab hold of that and it's going to be a huge sea state change in thinking. Because what that says is that we are, we, the physical world here, physical universe, is a subset of something bigger, something more fundamental than us. Because we are, are in a simulated uni universe that is simulated someplace else. That someplace else is the source of us, and therefore we're a subset of a bigger source. Well, that almost sounds religious, doesn't it? You know, that, uh, that's going to be very unsettling. So science is having a hard time getting there because they see that coming too and they don't want to go there. So you have scientists kind of dragging their feet in that direction, but their science keeps pushing them anyway that that is the way it is. So they can only you know, suppress that so long. So when they get to that point, a whole lot of minds are now going to be opened that are closed. Bigger picture. Now we live in this bigger picture. And it's not religion. It doesn't have anything to do with belief. Guys, this is science. This is the way the world is. See, that's different than saying, oh, yeah, I knew that all along because my religion told me, well, religion you can blow off because that's about belief. When science says it, it's another whole matter altogether. When science says it, you know, I, I call scientists the, the, the high priests of Western culture, you know, the high priests are the people that, that tell us what to believe, you know, so the scientists tell us this is true, then suddenly – it's way out of the realm of religion. It's, an, it's, it's the nature of reality. And that will change everything. <clears throat> and when we go into that, well, if it's not materialist, what is it? And during that conversation, if we come out the other end with a sense that it's consciousness and consciousness, you know, is, is what's fundamental, which to me is a, is a very logical step you can see that that is where the argument is going to have to end up because that's the only logical place for it to end up everything else is illogical so when we say that the computer is conscious is the computer you see at that point i think we'll be in a mindset where these things we're talking about attributes of consciousness databases things that you can see without eyes will all start to make sense to people 
and the fact that you need to grow up in order to do this. And that if you do it, it actually helps you grow up. <laughs> you know, it helps you grow up to do this. You know, and as people do it and say, oh, that's interesting. Oh, I can learn to do that too. They'll start to grow up. And the more they grow up, the less likely they are to want to steal your card, your credit yeah. card number, you see. Yeah. And the whole thing then kind of builds on itself to a point where we can be in a totally different world we're in right now. Yeah. So that is my view of the future. And I can see that in maybe a couple of decades at best, maybe a century at worst, but in a couple of decades at best. And I think that's the way it's going to have to go. But the things that you're doing with showing people that this works, helping people see for themselves by teaching them that it works, that's just building this undercurrent of knowledge yes. in the population so that when physics finally gets to that point that says, oh, this is a virtual reality, oh, a lot of things will fall into places for people because they already have have read about you or have done it. A lot of people have used their intent. They've learned how to heal with their minds. You know, a lot of people have done these things. And when they have, it's not going to be that sharp a turn to go into a bigger picture that's, that's more profitable, you see. So you're part of the solution. By doing this stuff, by teaching people, by showing them, by talking about it, you're part of the solution. You're helping people see a bigger reality. You're helping them mature and grow up. And that is what we need. And if we had about a billion people that were that mature, then turning this corner would be easy. The other seven and a half would follow right along yeah. if we have enough people doing it. But it's this conjuncture of physics saying that virtual reality is, a, is good science and being ready in humanity to be able to take that and do something profitable with it. Right. Rather than just get into a big food fight, my God's a better programmer than your God. You know, we, we don't want to go there, you know. So that's the point. So all of this has to kind of happen together. And the timing has to be such that it's like that. So I think the timing isn't quite ready yet for, you know, Pair Labs and for you to make this, the scientists to grab it and say, yep, great science. This is the way the world is. Privacy's done. You know, I don't think we're ready quite for that. And as you push on that, it's going to be like banging your head against the wall. It's going to be so frustrating. Just like if you talk to or read the stuff that the Pair Lab people, they were so frustrated because they had the science. They had their credentials. Geez, they were from Princeton University. They were good. They knew what they were doing and nothing, right? Nobody would look at it. Nobody would even discuss it. Nobody would come in when they invite people in and say, please come look at our protocols. Tell us what we're doing wrong. Point out our errors to us. Nobody would come because nobody wanted to find out that they didn't have any errors. It's better to just, you know, believe that you're right than it is to pry and find out that you're wrong, particularly when it scares you half to death if you're wrong. So, yeah, they couldn't even come, you know, people who said, no, it's wrong. And they'd say, well, good, tell us where it's wrong. Come on, we'll, you know, we'll fix it. We'll show you everything we do. You know, you can stay as long as you like, you know, probe every detail. Tell us what's wrong. Nobody would come. Well, there were one or two people who did come, and they couldn't find anything wrong. And then they lost credibility because they said they couldn't find anything wrong. Therefore, they weren't very smart because... <laughs> Obviously, there must be something wrong. You see, well, after that, nobody else comes. <laughs> no, nobody's going to come and, and do that. So I, I feel your frustration when you start doing science and you get this crazy pushback and you get this, this irrational stuff. Somebody comes, you get a scientist there, they see what you're doing, they measure it, they say, okay, there were no photons at the eyes, no photons inside the mask. Well, some light must have gotten there somehow. Yeah. Now, we don't know how, but it must have, you know, and you want to pull your hair out and, and, and shout, but it's just we're, we're not quite ready for that yet. Yeah. But we are ready for people like you to help spread this, spread the understanding, spread the knowledge, spread the experience. Experience is great. You know, if, if 100,000 people went through your course, we'd be much closer to being able to take that turn. You know, and uh, 
and grow up as a people. Then if not, so yeah, I'm 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 really glad glad that people like you are out there doing what you're doing. <clears throat> Thank you. Because I have a you know I have a, an understanding and and I came at it from from studying consciousness and from studying physics. I'm a physicist, but I'm a consciousness researcher, and I basically just like you, you know. I see I see facts in front of me, so I make up a story that explains them. I mean, that's how science works. You know, that's what I do too. So I had all these facts that I knew from my studying consciousness, from studying that, that realm, that larger consciousness system. And I had all these facts because I'm a physicist, and this is how the world works. And I just came up with a model that tied all of that together, so there was just one simple model that explained everything on both sides. But, you know, is that, it, does that mean that model's true? Well, that doesn't mean the model's true. It just means that's what I made up because that's the best thing I could make up to answer all the facts that I knew. So, I mean, that's what we do, right? That's the way science works and that's called a model. So I made a model just like, you know, you make models of, of, what, you, of what you're doing and a model is judged not by how many people believe it's true, it's judged by how well does it answer the facts? How well does it explain the facts on the ground? You see? So my model explains the facts that you guys put on the ground. You can see without eyes. You can hear without ears. You know, and you can see things in the dark. You know, it's not about photons. It's not about light. It's not about brain. There is no brain. It's a virtual brain. There is no body. It's a virtual body. Body, And once you get this virtual reality idea, then everything gets simple. It gets really, really simple. It's a hard thing to get your arms around, but once you get it, everything else just falls out as trivial. So I've even been able to derive quantum mechanics and, and relativity from basic principles, something that scientists can't do now. They have to, they start with assumptions and they don't know why those assumptions are true. They just know they're true. Particles are probability distributions. Why? I have no idea. All I know that if I use that in the math, it works. Speed of light's a constant. Why? I have no idea. I just know that, you know, we keep measuring and it's always the same thing. It seems like it's a constant and I can move a source of light and then, then shine a light from that moving source and it doesn't come out faster it comes out just the speed of light no matter how the source is moving so nothing else works that way but light does why well physics doesn't know it's one of those paradoxes but if you have a virtual reality then the answer is simple you can you know you can derive science much better than the than science can from the same basic principles that explain consciousness so anyway it all just pulls together so when i hear seeing without eyes, and then I watch you doing a tape that Oliver did with the little people, you know, reading books and driving their little cars around and that other sorts of things going on, you know, it's clear to me exactly how that works. Mm. But I wanted to see how did you teach it? Because that's not an easy thing to get people to do. I mean, people spend a long, long time learning just how to see a picture in remote viewing. And it takes a long time before they're very good at it. And here you have these little kids. They're not only re remote viewing a picture. They're remote viewing reality. They're remote viewing, you know, in real time. Yeah. Which is like remote viewing, you know, on steroids. That's, that's yeah. really good. And you're not only doing that, but you're teaching it to these kids in a few weeks. You know, and you're teaching to adults in a few weeks. So the, the, the course that you put together was... Um, was amazing and how you do that and how you're successful at it I was very interested in that's why I came to the to, to uh, Evelyn's course because I wanted to see it's not so much I wanted to see without my eyes I understand all of that and the data is there and and I got all the theory and I know exactly how it works and why it works but I wanted to see how you taught people and uh, it was good it was very clever I thought it was genius the way you <coughs> You basically tricked people into letting go of their belief that it couldn't be done by allowing them to believe that they were cheating when they were not. <clears throat> At least that's the way it was in Evelyn's class. Everybody who said, yeah, I can read, uh, they're saying, but I'm really cheating. They weren't cheating. 
<laughs> they just believed they were cheating, which was which was what allowed them to do it. <clears throat> it uh, it it gave them permission basically to see without their eyes if they could believe that it was because that little bit of light that was coming in around the edge of that mask, you know. But that little bit of light coming in around the edge of that mask couldn't possibly form an image. If you know anything about optics, you know that that doesn't work. You know, you have to have direct rays of light from the object, you know, impinging on the lens. If those rays of light bounce around on a whole bunch of things first before they get to your eyes, there's no more image in there anymore. It's gone. <coughs> so <coughs> this mask, the only way you see that little bit of light is because it works, you know, some little bit of stray light will work around maybe through the foam or something, and you'll get little bits. There's a little corner here that isn't pressed against. None of that is going to allow me to read the license plate on that car over there or to read a book, you see. That's but if people believe that it does, oh, yeah, that little bit of light, that lets it in so I can... I can read that book because of the way that light's coming in. Now they drop their opposition to it. They they drop their belief that they can't do it, and they start doing it. They start mm -hmm. seeing it. Yeah. Well, we um, Evelyn teaches uh, following Max methodology to teach adults, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically what I call right brain uh, right brain approach. Right. Uh, and right brain very, very briefly means play, uh, fun, fast, and easy. That's right. what the right brain wants. Right. And uh, the advantage is that indeed with this methodology, everybody can see quite fast, reasonably fast, and reasonably well, and reasonably easy. The disadvantage of that is that for the adults, being easy is not good. Being fast is not good because it doesn't meet their expectations. Hmm. Everybody is ready to accept, oh, yeah, sure, a kid can do it immediately, but me? Mm-hmm. It can't be. There right. must be, again, something wrong. There must be some right. light going in or exactly. the not light proof or, or something like that. And if those adults happen to be engineers or scientists or technical, oh, oh yeah. now their walls are really high and really exactly. thick, you know, and they're the ones that aren't going to be able to do anything because they know for sure that, you know, exactly. it, it's impossible. They give you a lecture of how this is impossible. Yeah. Right. So when I joined and I started teaching, uh, I thought, let's change things, turn things around. Let us meet the expectations, which is it has to be slow and tedious and difficult and sweaty, the whole <laughs> learning process. Mm -hmm. and you know, all of that. Um, and so what we are, the way we are teaching now, which is basically me, the mask part, is precisely that. People don't get to read by the, the fifth day. People don't get to run around. People don't get to do any of the things that you saw in Evelyn's mm -hmm. seminar. But what they do get is... The process is so slow and difficult that they get it. There is no light, which mm -hmm. there isn't anyway, but now they get it. Mm -hmm. and basically, basically, you exhaust their intellectual control. Exactly. exactly. See, if yes. you, they, you have to get them out of this intellectual control world exactly. into yes. their intuitive or consciousness viewpoint. Right. And there's several ways, and one way is to just beat them and beat them and beat them to where they finally yeah. give it up and say, ah, oh, well, you know, and then st as soon as they give up, then it yeah. starts to work. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's what so, doing. yeah. So that's just that's another that's yeah. another uh, yeah. way of doing. And then it. on the fifth day, I tell them about the two methodologies, and I explain to them why we used the difficult one. Now you got it, good. Now let's experiment with the normal one, the easy one, the fun one, the pleasant mm -hmm. one, the, you know, joyful one. 
But, and then I warn them, inevitably, one million percent, this doubt will come to you when you start experimenting with Marx methodology. When that mm -hmm. comes, question it. Mm -hmm. And prepared like that, they do question it. And I'm telling them, don't expect me to explain to you that it's not the eyes. Don't expect me to do the work to convince you that it's not the eyes. This is your job. Whether you can do it or not, that's your responsibility. I'm not getting into your mind to explain anything. Right. Intellect anyway, only. You don't get to the subconscious by <laughs> in logical, yeah. photon, whatever. Right, right. They want a prescription. Do this, do this, do this. Exactly. You know, turn around three times, howl at the moon once, and you'll yeah. be able to read without eyes. You oh, know? If it were that easy. <laughs> yeah, they, they want a prescription because yeah. they process reality through their intellect. So yeah. they can follow steps, and they want you to tell them what to do in order to be able to do this thing. You know, well, it doesn't work like that. You have to change the way you you see reality. You yeah. have to let this intuitive side, or you have to let this side that uh, that accesses the information that's available. You have to let that grow, and you have to develop it. Just like yeah. you have to develop that intellectual side. You know, exactly. you have to develop this other side, and it's not a it's not a quick process. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah that's uh, I know I th I do. Uh, I do talks with people. I do intensives also, and I teach people how to, uh, you know, work with telepathy. You know, how to connect, contact other entities that are non-physical, how to uh, heal, how to diagnose. So I go through all of that, and people struggle with it, but it's all the same thing. You know, what you're doing, what I'm doing, it's all the same thing. There, is, there isn't anything really different about it. Everything that's paranormal is basically it's the same thing. It's yeah. all about accessing information. And you don't do that through your intellect. It has to be done through that non-intellectual side of you, which I call the intuitive side, but it's, it's the side that's, that can, uh, that um, you could call it the right brain side. You know, maybe that, that helps a little bit. It's, the, it's that intuitive right brain holistic don't break it down into logical pieces. You just get whole chunks. It just happens. Yeah. And and it doesn't happen for material reasons. It happens because consciousness isn't material and you're not really a physical body, your consciousness. So yeah, I've I've done that too. So I'm very familiar with all the you know, with those with those uh with those techniques. Yeah. But it's good. It's good. The more people who experience this for themselves and realize that they can yeah. do it. The better, the better we're going to be yeah. in, the, in the long run. The quicker we're going to get to the point where it's able to, for us all to make that turn. Yeah. All we need is a sizable, a sizable minority. It's not yeah. like all seven and a half billion of us have to figure it out. Only a, you know, maybe ten percent of us or five percent of us need to figure it out. Once science says that this viewpoint that consciousness is the computer and we're a subset of something bigger and all of that if that's science not religion then people will people's minds will open they'll change they'll start looking for bigger pictures and looking for answers and instead of having one tenth of one percent of the population being seekers you're going to have like 30 percent of the population are going to be turned into seekers at that point and if they're seeking they will find yeah you know, they'll find people like you and and uh, and me and and so on. So yeah, I see we're all on the same team. You know, working on a similar sort of thing. You know, trying to trying to help get these ideas a, across. Yeah. And I do and, like and I do appreciate what we are trying to do. It looks like not really successful our attempts with the scientists, but for me. Um, it's helped me understand things about what InfoVision does on the material level, basically in the brain and in the rest of the body. And that helped me improve the methodology because I understood that we were teaching just this, but look how the brain reacted 
So then maybe we can add something to that and add some more or change this or make it mm -hmm. faster because you see the brain rest like that. So if we can make this even faster or whatever it is. So the, the few studies that we've done so far were very insightful to me that I understood a lot of things and that's how I developed the therapy in the commas branch because mm -hmm. I got this intuition at some point that basically the the short list at the time that infovision could help with the issues like sight problems from glasses to complete blindness or hearing problems or at that time we also had speech problems if they were emotional in uh, right. uh, cause uh, some learning disabilities and IQ which is related a little bit to learning disabilities uh, I got this flash one day that what if this list is longer actually mm, yes it is and it, include, it includes health problems. Exactly. It's an open mm. list now. We've right. added on that list so many things. We didn't even know anything about those, like Alzheimer. We knew nothing about Mark is engineer. I'm a literature, I'm a teacher, so nothing about this. We added Parkinson. We added autism. We added uh, ADHD, brain palsy, so many things. Uh, Down syndrome. Down syndrome. Like it looks indeed uh, like it, this is a new reality that we are experiencing with InfoVision now. Really a new reality compared to some years ago. And this, I'm sure, will be so outdated in three, four years uh, in the future. And that's what fascinates me about InfoVision because it's a, it's a dynamic thing it doesn't yeah. stay there it's not in a frame that okay once you learn it you do it mechanically repetitively and there you have it and one other thing that i enjoy about it is that there is no guarantee uh, there is no guarantee about um, whether you are going to uh, you, you can help that person or not and that makes you be in the present you cannot rely on your past no. experience on your memory or oh, with that person i did like this so let me just copy paste with this one it doesn't work you oh, have no. to be alert and present you can't really fix anybody everybody has to fix themselves <laughs> right. what you're doing is giving them a, a process and a context that enables them to fix themselves by growing up and getting a bigger picture and le letting go of that little picture that's causing the problem. Yeah, a lot of I've read several physicians who have come to the conclusion that about eighty or ninety percent of all the illness they see, you know, is not physical based. I mean, it is physical based in the sense that there's a pain in my back, you know, mm -hmm. and there's a pain here, and you know, you have all these physical symptoms, but the root cause of the of the of those symptoms is not a physical cause. Yeah. It's a cause because when you are trapped in an intellectual world, particularly when there's so much uncertainty and there's so much that you don't understand, you, with your fear, get all wadded up, get a lot of stress, and all of that stuff then builds to where now your back hurts and this hurts and, you know, you you see double vision and you have all these issues that happen to you just because inside that intuitive part of you is all wadded up in a knot and then you help them untie the knot but they have to do it yes. they have to change themselves and all you can do is offer them a pathway that they can do to change themselves but if they still have too much fear or if they just don't have what it takes to change themselves then they won't exactly. it just won't work for them yes yeah, I've learned or, that. Or it takes a lot longer. Yes. You know, it may work for them, but it may take three or four times longer because you, it's just like getting over those, those it's impossible barriers. You know, you have to get past a lot of barriers, a lot of fear barriers that people have put up.
Yeah. A lot of you know self-centeredness. A lot of you know, there's a lot of emotional energy stored into those bears, and they have to get through all that to let it go, and then they can heal themselves. Yeah, we have this very clear. Uh, we we see this very clearly in uh, blind people. We have blind people who, in four days, are reading, just like mm. now Mark had uh, <clears throat> in mm -hmm. New York. Fourth day, he could read quite large font size words on the computer screen. But that's mm -hmm. impressive. Four days. Right? Sure. 25 years old, blind from 12. So that's already, mm -hmm. you know, half of his age was blind. And then we have students like I have here in Bucharest for one year and something, a couple of months, he can still only distinguish, not really see, but distinguish colors. Mm -hmm. And when I very softly touched the subject that, you know, it's not the eyes really, it's not even the brain, it's your emotions, your trauma, there's a trauma there. Uh, he mm -hmm. immediately shut me out and she said, I don't want to talk about trauma. Mm -hmm. End of the story. So right. okay, we meet and stare at those papers <laughs> because he wants it and he enjoys it. Yeah. Okay, we meet mm -hmm. and we stare and hopefully some time he will be ready to deal with the trauma and then he will see. Until then, there's not much I can do at least. No. Have you ever had success with people who were born blind, people who don't have retinas or don't have whatever? Yeah, you should you should be able to. I mean, there's no reason that it doesn't have to do with eyes, but I would think they would be a little more difficult because they don't have the concept, they don't have the, the structure to exactly. build on. You yeah. have to help them create the structure for them to build the concepts on. Yeah, you have to replicate the teaching process yeah. which happens naturally when you have a baby. You just talk to them. You don't have the impression right. that you teach them really. You just talk, you know, this is mommy, this is daddy, and so right. on. You don't, you know, give a lecture about that to your baby. Whereas with a grown-up, no matter the, the age, you have to, you know, like in school almost, you have to actually teach them, you know, this paper that you're holding on in front of your eyes now is what we call red. This is what we call this and that. So you you literally teach mm -hmm. vision. Yeah. So, so you that, you have you have had the born blind people and uh, good. See yeah. that you know that is a particularly if they're born blind because they lack the physical equipment. You know they don't have a retina. They don't have an a, you know an optic nerve. They don't have, you know, the, the mechanics to do that. That seems to me better than any other experiment that you might ever be able to do. Yeah. That one is one that science would have such a, a very hard time trying to mm. say, well, he can't really read because all they have to do is, you know, see him read. Yeah. And then, if, yeah, of course, they can say, well, okay, he memorized that and this all this yeah. is a scam. But then it's like, well, come on over to our lab and bring your own reading material. And yeah. it's, it's, you know, it, um, it is something that is, um, there, there, it's one of those things that is non-technical, easy to understand, and it's very hard to deny it. Yeah. You know, now, people will still try to deny it, of but course. it's more difficult to deny than probably anything else you do. Is that here's somebody doesn't have eyes, doesn't have eyeballs, you know, doesn't have a retina, doesn't have a, an optic nerve, and they can read, and they can see things. Yeah, and cheat. <laughs> yeah, just need to give them ways to cheat, yeah. so that they so that they can do it. <laughs> True. Yeah. Uh, okay, guys. Can I add a little bit more? <clears throat> you know, very interesting conversation. First of all, uh, we become the first one who start to use for uh, teaching people see being blindfolded. We start to use mindful uh, mask. Can I ask you, I know answer, but uh, why all other mask was not working, but this mindful is working? And I don't want to receive the answer, I give it. <coughs> that is the first mask that we start to use. 
keep the eyes, give the possibility to keep the eyes open. It's completely a proof, like proof, but I, our eyes are open. And my understanding, our brain, not just only our million years of evolution of the human creatures, not human creatures, life creatures, say that you can receive visual images just only with your eyes are open. Mm -hmm. All so other believe. mask, it's, it's genes memory. All other mask that we used before, it was completely cover the eyes because we was worried maybe that cheating blah 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 in this mask so brain when uh, we make the old one mask and eyes are closed it received visual information but brain thinks stop 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 how can I receive visual information if my eyes are closed and it blocked this information in <laughs> yeah, sure. our mask mindful mask eyes are open brain received this visual information and it believed it believes that that is through the eyes. And if it's through the eyes, it's supposed somewhere, window, gap, some, and it creates this virtual on a mask, virtual window, which virtual hole, and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So exactly. that was a really revolutionary uh, way to teach people. Right. Only after this, our adult person start to uh, be teached and possibility to receive visual information. Right. It just so helps them is, get over that belief. Yes. You know, yes. It helps them yes. get over that belief. That, is, that they can't that it's impossible. But they can open their eyes well now, it's more possible, you know, because my eyes are open and oh look, I can cheat and that even yeah. makes it more possible. And finally you break down that barrier and there they are reading without eyes because they don't that know enough it. about technology to know that what they're doing is impossible. Yeah. Now it's couple, couple more points, maybe more, uh, more, less serious. Follow Mikhail methodology, people can live forever, never die. Because uh, her methodology creates possibility of the body to fix everything that was created. Fix liver, fix heart, fix everything. You can live forever. And my student asked me uh, how, how it can it's time Earth have some limit. So with time come, if we will be forever, we'll stand for, uh, like that one and make <gasps> just only with the command. I say no, we will leave the world, but not because uh, some liver or heart problem. I like to compare. I said to my student, for example, I find an internet serial, 50 series. Interesting. I start to watch it first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven. And I say, I'm sorry, guy. I tired. I turn it off. I know it's interesting, but I turn it off. We are worried and sad about dying because we live not so much. 70, 80, 90, 100 maybe somebody a year, but it's not enough. But if you have possibility to live 200, 300, 400 years, well, let's say about myself, I'm living 250 years. I grow my, I grow my kids, grandkids, grand grandkids, I did do, I did that, and I feel I'm tired. It's enough for me. I'm completely satisfied. And I'll die and nobody will cry, no, why you leave us? <laughs> we will we will leave this world, but not because some our organs, uh, but because we will feel that it's time. And the third one that I want to say, it's not a joke, but it's supposed to be funny. Just imagine if uh, InfoVision come to the world and everybody will receive visual information without using eyes. So eyes problem disappear. Nobody need glasses. Can you imagine how many people lost their business, all this Gucci and others? Mm -hmm. That will be problem that InfoVision create. And if follow Mikhail's methodology, we can fix all our organs by itself, self-healing, she call it. Doctors. We don't need you. 
doctors. <laughs> that will be another big problem that information breaks the world. That is generally I want to say something maybe not funny but interesting. And problem information will be not just on the scientists, but right. manufacturers, doctors. So sure. that is I want to say. There will be a lot of people who will have self interests to deny that these things are real. So you're not only going to get denial from scientists, but you're going to get denial from all sorts of people. Just like when you try to help people and and, uh, and they resist you, basically what you're getting is, is is a denial that it's them. You see, they, they want their problem to be some outside thing that you can fix. Yes. Because then it's not their responsibility. It's not them. It's not that I'm somehow, you know, have made this problem oh, this problem is caused by something outside and something outside will fix it. That's much <laughs> more easy to deal with than I'm really the cause of this problem and I need to fix myself first. Well, a lot of people won't go there because that means they have to take responsibility for themselves rather than <laughs> pointing the finger at something else. So it's much easier to believe that the doctor says, well, it's because your spine is twisted a little bit here and that. That's what your problem is. All we have to do is untwist it you know, and you'll be fine. But it never seems to work. Or it comes back and they have all these problems because they don't want to admit responsibility for who and what they are. They want to be able to point a finger and blame something else. And getting people to get to that point where they take responsibility is not necessarily an easy path to get there. They, they resist. So, yeah, you'll get resistance from all sorts of, all sorts of places. Absolutely. It'll change economics. It'll change medicine. It'll, you know, it'll change all sorts of things. Well, I think uh, it won't necessarily change anything. Um... To do InfoVision, to want to use InfoVision as a tool for dropping glasses or healing or whatever, already requires a specific level of consciousness, which is actually that in itself which allows and creates the healing. It's not InfoVision really, it's that right. particular level. But right. the more people grow, the more they will not get into disease anymore in the first place. Yes. So the competition, inverted commas, between InfoVision and Glasses Company is not real. There is no competition. It's the level of consciousness of each individual which will decide, which will choose, I want glasses or I want healing. Not necessarily for vision, I want healing. It can be meditation, it can be yoga, it can be drinking tea, it can be anything, you know, just praying or whatever. So this understanding that this fear, it's not an understanding, this fear that they have, conscious fear that, oh, let's not confirm, let's not acknowledge for vision as a fact because they will steal all our clients that is so childish <laughs> yes. and shows me how immature they indeed are. It's right. not like, you know, if you're writing the book now that, okay, you can see without your eyes, people will suddenly flock all of them to InfoVision and, you know, overnight, glasses business will go bankrupt. It's not like <laughs> Yeah, that is as I said. Yeah, no, well, you know, you also maybe you ought to think about info hearing for deaf people. Yes. You know, that's, and we work with them. And, in, and info, them. info healing, you know, for sick people. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's all part of the same thing. It's not just about vision. Yeah. It's, about, it's about consciousness and people growing up and taking responsibility yes. and developing that intuitive side of themselves um, that right now is still a baby a baby version of it they've never worked on it yeah i think taking responsibility is the door opener to the intuition side once you 
understand that it's you creating what you call reality for yourself, then you start to pay attention to details, then you make sense of what happened and you are careful about what may happen and what you do want to happen rather than you know blaming all on outside on the outside and expecting as you said that the outside comes and saves you or explains yeah. you even or teaches you or sure and when you get to that point it doesn't mean that that uh, bad things won't happen to you they might but when they do you don't really see it as a bad thing you yeah. see it as a, you see it as a challenge oh, okay this roadblock just came here now how am i going to deal with that how's yeah. the best how's the best way to deal with it or this you know my mother died or my wife died or something happened i got you know somebody got run over by a truck and how do you deal with that and suddenly instead of approaching it as oh woe is me you know a terrible thing and and you know going the self pity route yeah. you approach it as okay how's a positive way to deal with the world and then suddenly there really aren't any bad things that happen there's only there's only opportunities to grow yeah information in itself is not positive is not negative it's neutral it's facts how it's i all, yeah. it makes it look positive right. or negative and today i may be happy about this particular thing and tomorrow all of a sudden i may be unhappy of the same thing but the thing sure. is the same today and tomorrow it's i've changed my interpretation my reaction to that thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well this has been fun thank you <laughs> like thank you this has been this has been good so how many people a year do you teach well we haven't counted them but like thousands yeah a few thousands that's good and where do you do this new york no i started from new york and worked here approximately five years but one of my Friend, Professor Karatkov invited me for in Moscow for conference, international conference, and I showed the kids from uh, internet for their blind kids and show how do they blind kids and how they uh, can uh, copy color papers go with me. So after that, many people come to me and say, "How do you do? That is my uh, business card. That is my my call me plus plus blah blah blah." And that is what the beginning for InfoVision come to the world, for the beginning in Russia, because I was born in Russia and lived there for years. Then I was invited to uh, Baltic uh, states, countries, and it goes, we count with Mikhail, it's approximately more than 20 countries we made uh, our seminars, included China, Dubai, Germany, Austria, more than 20. Mm, good. Mm? Australia. Good. Australia, yes, in Australia. People know about, uh, people know about us and invited. So, yes, we enjoy it so much. And thinking, try to find more explanation, more points uh, for InfoVision. So I can say for both of us, we are falling in love in InfoVision. We love it like a crazy. And for us, InfoVision, it's our kid. And we're supposed to care about this. You know, I had some suit in Moscow. Uh, suit, correct? Uh, court. Ah, lawsuit, yes. A lawsuit, yes. One company, a TV company, makes some terrible <coughs> uh, report about me and my friend says me you know it's it's impossible who are you going to fight with government tv station it's hundred percent you will lost it but i said you know that is my kid in television and if i ignore it i will be a very bad father i must fight it let me lose it but in my in front of myself I know that I did everything to protect, to fight for my kid. Yes, it was more than a uh, more than year different 
instead in Stancy, I don't know how to say it. Finally, they, yes, I lost it. It was impossible. But I know that I fight for my kid. So I'm saying it again, we completely fall in love with Infovision and I'm happy that I have so nice co-author as a Mikhail. So, yeah. Well, that's what uh, it's all about. At the core, it's all about love, isn't it? It's all about caring. It's all about giving. That's what. It, that, that's the key thing. It's about helping. Yeah, and that's the the biggest reward. At the same time, when what you have to offer is received. In yeah. Romanian, we have a, a saying. It's a religion based saying, but it's really, really beautiful. Uh, in the countryside, still, when somebody offers something to somebody else uh, and they say thank you you don't say my pleasure or well any other uh, phrase you say let it be received <laughs> that's very beautiful and that's when we are most happy when whatever we have to offer it's accepted right. full-hearted and it's right. then when miracles, inverted commas, happen. And that's so beautiful to witness miracles happening right in front of your eyes. Oh, yes. And you change people's <laughs> lives dramatically. Yes. And then these people go on to change other people's lives. Yes. Yeah. So True. it's oh, it's good. That's what it's... Uh, Please take them. Sorry? Okay, because... Uh, we start to talk together and I say to him, continue, okay, now let me say what I want to say. You know, <clears throat> I say in America, I have two words, price and value. And how can we call in the money uh, value that when we see the woman who kids was born blind and these kids start to see it's it's kind of transfer with the, with the money. It's value without prices. Without sure. that is that is give us the most the most the biggest satisfaction and give us uh, power. Continue to yes. do infovision. Continue to fight for infovision. Continue, continue, continue. Yeah, because we also have the opposite experience in which. It is not received what we have to offer. And in the beginning, both Mark and me, different beginnings in time, but both of us in the beginning, we thought everybody will want it, right? Like, oh, I can see, I can stop being blind. Oh, so everybody will flock around to, oh, let's do it. But it's not like that, indeed. The same thing, fear, fear of also seeing we had experience mm -hmm. when people would tell us, Mark had a student, uh, he was 50-something years old, and he had gone blind when he was a teenager or something. And he came to Mark's seminar generally pushed by a friend. And he came because he was trillion percent sure nothing will happen. But something did happen. He started to see. <coughs> and he didn't come the second day. And Mark said, what's with your friend? Why isn't he here? And this guy <laughs> said, he doesn't want to do it because, and this was interesting. So he said, uh, he won't come anymore because he doesn't want to see himself in the mirror old. Which isn't the reason. It's just an excuse. Of course. <laughs> He doesn't come anymore because being able to see would totally change and remake yeah. his whole life, and that's just too scary. Yes, yes. <laughs> and we had an initiative in Italy. One organization invited us to <coughs> work with blind from the Blind Association, and we said, sure, we would be more than happy to do that, but left brain, Mihaela said, we have a list of requirements that we would like to be met. And one of them were the, the, <laughs> was we want everything to be um, confirmed and acknowledged by 
optician, <laughs> doctor, <laughs> to show that we have done our work, <laughs> that we didn't just pretend we can do that, we are doing <laughs> And we want papers to confirm that. And the answer was, oh, but if they see that we can see, we will lose our state allowance and all the <laughs> So no, thank you. <laughs> so it ended before it started. And we get yeah. quite often this kind of, <laughs> you know, sad, I would say. Yeah. Uh, response from people. You should you remember again yeah. in Italy, we have a student in our class, he was blind <clears throat> and he started to see and he said, please, I don't want you to say somebody that I start to see because yeah. I lost government financial support. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah, people don't like change. Yeah. Change is scary. So when you, you do things, I mean, what you're doing for people creates great change for them. Yeah. And that's frightening for most people. Yeah. Change, is, change is, is very scary for, for most of you. Yeah. You know, you have to, you have to uh, be able to live gracefully with uncertainty. Yes, exactly. And accept mm -hmm. people not wanting it. It's mm. hard to process. Really, just like you know, anybody has situations, things, relationships, opportunities that we refuse, we decline, we don't want them, we are afraid, we feel we are not ready, and we find excuses like this is not good, or not now, tomorrow, or whenever. So, it's what makes us human on mm -hmm. this particular level of consciousness that we are now. So if I am like this, why should I be, you know, disappointed or sad or frustrated that somebody else does the same? It's <clears throat> all in the same game, right. playing the same game, right. governed by the same rules. It's not us governing the rules, it's the rules governing us still. Well, I think maybe we've done it. Yeah. <clears throat> I think the same. You know, okay, let me say first of all, thank you very much, first of all, to Oliver that he organized our so interesting meeting with so interesting person like Tom. Thank you, really, thank you. And uh, Oliver, I have your uh, Gmail address. I, went, I wrote two books <clears throat> and I want to send a few pages from one of this book because it's so strongly um, touch or crossing with our today's conversation so it will be, I believe it will be interesting for you to read it and if you think Good. it's read it transfer it to Tom because it's it's really I so positively surprised that scientists big scientists like Tom says that the scientists can care about the future. They are afraid of this one, they are run from this one. It's, it surprises me. He is a scientist and he says this words about scientists. I have this my mind uh, in my book, this one. That is the reason why I want to send it to you, this part of the book. And uh, I, in my imagination, create the future of Infravision and not at Infravision, future of the our planet Earth through Infravision. In my mind, it will be interesting to read. And okay, again, uh, thank you, Oliver, thank you, Tom, for this very interesting meeting. And uh, I hope that it will be our just first meeting. Let it be continue. You will have questions, we will have questions. Mm -hmm. I, I will be. Mm, I, um, like your, if you come 
to our seminar because uh, I'm going to fly to Europe on 10th of February and we have some schedule so we can be in touch and uh, I could invite Michaela here, try to invite Michaela here to the United States, but for some reason she didn't receive uh, visa, but we hope it will be fixed. So if she come here, uh, we will make a meeting and maybe seminar here in the United States. So let's hope for the best. And if you want something, it comes. If you just don't think about this, it never comes. What did you want to say, Michaela? <clears throat> Not let's just think for the best, let's create the best. Yes, let's create it for the best. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I've enjoyed it. Uh, I've gotten to understand a little bit better uh, who you guys are and where you're coming from. And I think we're, we're uh, all coming pretty much the same place. You know, it's all about love. It's all about caring. It's what you can give. Um, the whole value in it is, like you say, is, is seeing that you actually are helping people. Yeah. And you see that you're, you're, you're mm -hmm. making it easier for them to help themselves. So it's us and, you know, 10,000 other people around the globe that are all, you know, helping this, this planet, this you know, humanity turn this corner to something more productive than what we see now. Yeah. This this materialistic mindset that it's all about me. Take whatever you can get, you know, and then and then fight to keep it. And that's not really a good way to you know base your life on. So hopefully we're going to make a big turn, so that uh, <clears throat> we'll we'll live in a much kinder, gentler place. And I think what you're doing and and the things that I'm doing are just trying to facilitate that yes. in the future. And if the future could be, you know, a de you know, a, a a decade or two, or it could be a century or two, don't know. You know, it doesn't have to be around while I'm here, you know, or or while you're here. But we're part of the solution, building toward that day when we'll make the whole planet a much kinder, nicer place to live. So we're part of the solution, and as are many other thousands of people. So yeah. let's just keep working and keep doing it, and. Yeah, I think your I think your course was was uh, was very very clever. See, I try to get people also over this barrier of it's impossible. They can't do it because their intellect gets in the way, and every time they start to get a, get something, their intellect jumps in front and analyzes it and knocks it you know gets rid of it, knocks it away. So I'm dealing with these kinds of issues all the time too. And your idea or the way you did this one, such that you led people who were non-technical to believe that they could cheat and get the answer, which then let them believe that it was possible. You know, and I thought that's brilliant. Yeah, that was very, very brilliant. You know, you get a mask where they can open their eyes, right? Because that makes the believing that it can happen easier. It's just one more barrier down. And then you get, and then you get a mask that, eh, you know, don't pick it too tight. You know, and I had mine real tight. I had mine pulled real, real tight. And Ellen comes around and says, oh, that's a little too tight. And she says, here, let me loosen it up a little bit. And then I said, yeah, but now some light's coming in. And she said, that's okay. That's not a problem. We need a little light to shine in, you know. Smile. And then when I smile, of course, that raises your cheekbones. It moves your mask up just a little bit. A little more a little light come in down here. And about the third day in, I say, ah, I know what's going on here. I got it. I see how this works. And it did work. It was just magic because people got over these barriers so much more quickly when they believed that there really was no barrier. They were just cheating. So the barrier disappeared because the barrier is all made in their own mind. You know, their mind creates the barrier. And when they thought that uh, it was because that little bit of light that was seeping through was the reason that they were able to read this book or, or do those things, then that made it possible for them to do it. And then I saw why it was important that that mask leak a little light and that you <clears throat> start with the, with the papers up here by the side so you can get those little dots of light in there because now you're successful, but eventually you can be successful with the paper here where it doesn't have anything to do with the light. But it's like, let people have a little success, lead them to doing that, 
and uh, help them break down that barrier of, of it being impossible with with successes. And that was that was uh, yeah, that was that was very brilliant. I think great course, really well done, and uh, very cleverly, very clever how you got past people's barriers. Very very clever. Yeah, that, that's mm -hmm. Max's genius. <laughs> And well, I, think, I think, you know, I've experimented a lot on myself with this not tight <clears throat> mask. And, of course, I cannot necessarily um, explain it logically, but there is no light going in. Not even when the mask is not tight, there is no light going in. When you look at somebody wearing the mask, from the outside, if the mask is not really tight, then the edge of the foam on the outside is not pressed to the skin. And that may seem to the, the person looking at the person wearing the mask as, oh, you see, there's a gap there, and there's where the mask goes in. But the inside edge of the foam is on the skin. There is no really light going in. Yeah. And I had this understanding which completely shocked me because I also thought that because that's what Mark told me and that's mm -hmm. his teaching. And I thought, yes, there is a, just a little bit to, to quiet my mind, to relax that I'm not crazy, you know, doing mm -hmm. something which is against my gene and... <clears throat> DNA. Uh, so a little bit of yeah. sanity <clears throat> there. And when I did the first electro retinography, uh, I was wearing at that time the mask the way Mark taught me, which was not tight. So I went to this experiment completely terrified because I thought, you know, this will show now that there is some light getting in. Mm -hmm. And there you have all the credibility <clears throat> of the vision gone because they will not be able to understand, yeah, there's just one photon getting in and you cannot read with that one. They will just say, there's light going in. Right. So right. I went to the experiment completely terrified. I couldn't sleep the night before the experiment because I was completely sure now, you know, the whole... Pandora box will be opened up. And I was the first to be completely shocked. For two weeks, I was in that shock um, to understand that the line um, indicating the activity, the response in the retina was completely flat, mm -hmm. which means that there was <clears throat> a photon going in. But when you see light, which is the first thing you see with the mask on, mm -hmm. it's very easy to be doubtful. It's very easy to say, oh, you know, maybe there's through the foam or between the foam and the skin mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And uh, But the more you get to the seeing colors, which is also easy to be doubtful, you know, through that little gap, Mm -hmm. One millimeter in diameter, you can see the color. Okay, fine. But when you start to read or you walk around, how can you explain that with that one photon going in, you can see all of that? And then for me, as you know, graduate of literature, I found for myself a very nice explanation question. <clears throat> explanation, which I think destroys the very foundation of the argument that there is some light leaking in. If there is light leaking in, then what I will see is the mask. Because that's the first object <coughs> in the visual field. We are not seeing through the mask. We see despite the mask. Right. Yeah. The point is that light that bounces around and then gets to your eye isn't going to show you what's what's outside the mask, of course. 
but yeah. the 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 thing is that when we when we create tools these are tools the the the, the course and the way it's run and so on is a tool for people to use to learn how to do this. Okay. Well, when you create tools, tools enable people to get past their barriers. That's the value of the tool. I have a lot of tools when I do my stuff too. You know, I, I use tools, mental tools. Yeah. In your case, it's mask and, and the light and the color papers and all that sort of the tools. But the thing that we have to re remember is that a tool can also create a limitation yes. because people begin to believe in the tool yes. that it's the tool that's doing it you see so now you put on a mask and you got a little bit of light coming in and if that little bit of light coming in helps convince you that you can read because you believe you're cheating of course now it's easier for you to read because you you can justify it in your mind you see but like, if you know a little optics, you know that that's impossible. It doesn't matter if light's coming in or not. You can't focus. You know, you're not going to get a letter or a, or anything else or even a color. You're not going to get a letter. You're not going to be able to read just because light's coming in and bouncing around in your mask. You have to get a direct photons yeah. from the letters to your eyeball to yeah. read. <clears throat> but yeah. it allows people to do it. So now let's say you have the light leaking in and you, you say, oh, yeah, that's, that's how I cheat. That's how I can do it. And that lets you reduce your barrier so you learn how to read. But now are you limited? <clears throat> because now you have the belief that you're cheating and the light comes in. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes in and says, well, let me tighten that mask. Or here, let me put you in this dark, perfectly black room. You might say, oh, well, I can't read anymore. Yeah. You so see? I would. Oh, I would. And now, because now you have a new barrier, I need my tool to read. You yeah. see, now when I get all my tools together and do my process, I can do it. But if you close off those things, now I know that I can't cheat and do it anymore, so I can't do it anymore. So the tools come with both advantages to help people learn and with traps if people think the tool is the reason that they're doing it. The tool isn't the reason that they're doing it. The tool helps them do it themselves. Yeah. It's not the tool doing it, you see. So that's I have that problem in mind. I'll give them tools and things to use, but I have to keep telling them, you know, the tool is just a metaphor. It's yeah. a thing to help you get your mind in the right space so that you can do these things. Don't take it literally. Don't feel like you're tied to it. So that's why somebody now, there was a little girl in the uh, in the film that, that Oliver did, who I was particularly impressed with, I think because she was a little older. But she was a little left brain, intellectual, bright little girl, I think around 11 years old. And um, as Oliver talked to her, you know, she, you know, she talked about how she could do this. And then he asked her, well, could you do it, you know, in, in another room? And she thought about it. Well, yeah, sure. Well, once you understand that you're doing it and it has nothing to do with the tool, has nothing to do with the light coming in, then darkness, other rooms, you know, suddenly, you know, the, the restrictions are all gone. But if you believe that you can only do it when you're wearing a mask, well, then you can't do it when you just close your eyes. Yeah. Oops, can't do it anymore. Yeah. You see, because the tool now has created a belief that the tool's necessary. Yeah. So. It's a it's an interesting thing. So there'll be some people who will say, I can't do it closing my eyes or I can't do it in a black room. I can only do it in this situation because it's that situation. They've learned that it works and anything else. You got to go back through the process of getting through the barriers again. But this little girl was so bright that she realized if I can do this with this mask on, I can do it with my eyes closed. I can do it in the room next door. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with my eyes. So she got that and immediately extrapolated to everything else. Yeah. Whereas other people don't get that and they're locked into the tool. Yeah. And the tool then will keep them from really using it because you can use this just getting information. You know, this, this fact that you tune in information, you use it in your everyday life. You don't have to go put a mask on in order to, in order to use it. You know, you don't, you don't want a tool to be so limited that it only does this okay, I can read with my mask on, but that's the only thing it gives me. No, you're learning how to access this data, this information, and you can access it for everyday things just because 
you've learned to get in that mental space, that intuitive space where it's available to you. Yeah. So it's, it's giving people tools to get them started, but then weaning them off the tools so that the tools don't trap them yeah. is, is a, are, another part of the process. Yeah. yeah, we understood this very clearly when we had people with glasses and they would read with the mask on better than <laughs> without the glasses. <laughs> right, right. Then as soon as they, they took the mask off, they would go back into not seeing well or clearly or that distance or this yeah, more. Right. So then we would have to work on this now that yes. we don't need the mask. That was just indeed to activate the brain or whatever. Yeah. We mm -hmm. But now you have it, so use it. You don't need the mask. Yeah. You don't be walking in the street with the mask. Use it. Yeah. You have it. It's in your brain. It's activated. Use it. Yeah, people have no idea how much of their reality is generated out of their own beliefs. Yeah. Yeah, and to get them past those beliefs is is problematic. Yeah, yeah. I keep I keep preaching to my people that it's just a tool, just a metaphor. You know, don't. It's just to help you do it. But once you do it, you don't need it anymore. You know, you can dispense with the tool. Yes. But you need the tool to help you get there. But once you get there throw the tool away. You know, I use binaural beats as a tool mm -hmm. and I have the people listen to the binaural beats because it puts them into a theta state, which is a place that it's easier to get into that, that, uh, uh, place where you are intuitive. It helps you get in that intuitive space and it helps shut down that intellectual space. Yeah. So it's an aid, but I, I keep telling them to so don't, you know, every once in a while, just take the headphones off, do it without it. Practice with it that way. You don't need them. They're just a, they're like training wheels on a bicycle. Exactly. You know, they help you. They help you balance in the beginning, but you can't really be good with it until you take the training wheels off. You'll never ride a bicycle very well if you keep the training wheels on. Yeah. You know, you gotta you gotta use the training wheels, learn how to balance on the bike, then have enough confidence that you can take the training wheels off, and now you really can ride a bike. So mm. it's. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting, the different processes and tools that we can make up. But that tool of allowing people to think that they were cheating is just absolute genius because that gave them a, a, a reason to believe that it was possible. Yeah. Even though anybody who like me who knows a little bit about physics and optics would tell them it doesn't matter whether that light leaks in there or not. It's impossible for you to read because light that's leaking in around your mask, you know, that's just totally impossible from a, from a physics standpoint, light doesn't focus that way. You know, you can't, you can't do that. Mm. It, uh, <clears throat> well, you know, optics, but whoever doesn't, they really mm. have a hard time to, to accept and they find all sorts of nonsense explanations as yes. to why this is possible. You know, just the, <laughs> the other yes. day, yeah, <clears throat> problem. The other day, I was talking with a guy, and I liked. The, I think this is going to be like some kind of a motto to me: the way people um, respond to uh, when you tell them about inverted commas paranormal things, abilities. Uh, so he asked me, "So what are you doing?" And I said, "I'm doing some paranormal thing." without giving any explanations. And he said, oh, I'm a logical guy. I don't believe in this. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Well, That's yeah. so much for logic, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> logic. yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm a logic guy, so I make my choices based on belief. Exactly. <laughs> yes. It can you know, be because it cannot be forever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. But you know, sometimes people come up with their own models. And their own models may, it doesn't matter whether the model is ridiculous or not. Yes, indeed. If it, it, if it works for them, if yes. it suits them and their own belief, then the model is useful. Yes. It's like, does the model work? So they may come up with some thing that, oh, after I put on the mask, the angel Gabriel comes and gives me, you know, visions of what's going on. And they have all the stuff that they, they go through. But if that works for them, it works for them. And it's fine. It's like, okay, that's a good model for you. You and Gabriel, you know, you can, you can see 
with you and the mask and Gabriel working together, you've got it. And that's fine. The only thing is that, again, tools come with traps. You know, so now if you if you have a tool that is limiting, because now, okay, I can't do it now because Gabriel's busy. You know, now you've got a limitation. You see, so, but I encourage people to make up their own tools. You know, and it doesn't matter how fantasyful they are. It's just beware that they come with limitations. So if you make one up that gives you a limitation, then pick a different, you know, make up something else. Yeah. But it has to be something that you resonate with, you know, that, that is something that helps you get over the blocks. So, yeah, tools can be anything. They don't have to be rational. They don't have to be logical. Matter of fact, some of the craziest tools, you know, seem to work the best for some people where that craziness is something they relate to. Yes. So it's uh, good, but they, you just have to keep in mind they come with traps. Every tool has its limitation. Yeah. And you have to know how to learn to do it with the tool, then learn to do it without the tool. Thank you. Yeah, so those people doing it with the mask ought to then learn to do it just with their eyes shut and then learn to do it in a dark room. And then learn to do it in the in the room next door, but I'm not so sure I'd teach too many of that as a possibility because what if, you know that's liable to cause them to get up to get frightened. Well, if I can do that to other people, other people can do that to me. Oh no! <clears throat> now anybody can look and see what I'm doing behind my closed door. <laughs> so they may have then a you know you may may be like the blind man that says no I don't want to see, you know it tears up my life. Of course, he won't tell you it tears up my life because he's supposed to be happy that it's changing his life. He'll make some other excuse. You know, is what they is what they tell you. Yeah, they don't so. want to see that in itself. Yeah, that's the, the actual blindness, the true blindness. Not that you cannot see the glass or the paper. <laughs> that right. is not blindness or right. sightness, for that matter. The sight. It's uh, the, the fact that. You deny to yourself. You you don't want to see about right. yourself. That's the true blindness. Yeah, yeah. Belief blindness, I yeah. call it. Yeah, I think that's very cute. Where you say, you know, I'm uh, I'm logical. I don't believe in this, you know, which is the yeah. most illogical <laughs> thing that you could possibly say. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I just loved it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How we work. Yeah. Oh, well, okay, yeah. folks, I'm going to need to go do something else here. And I uh, hope you do. You, <laughs> you haven't kept you too long. But I've enjoyed it a lot. It's been fun. It's always good to talk to other people who are doing similar things. You know, it's, it's, it makes you feel good that yeah. there's other people out there that are part of the solution as well. Thank you for all this time, all the long time that you offered to us it's uh, been no. very very interesting and in particular i want to thank you for telling mark to stop being so anxious and hopeful about the scientists because i have been telling them <laughs> and he wouldn't listen yeah. coming from you now he will accept yeah. well look up pair <laughs> labs look up pair labs and they'll have a story you know it's a um just google P-E-A-R, labs, and you will read their story, and you can see that you can have the most complete and perfect scientific evidence by credentialed people, and it really just doesn't make any difference because yeah. the population of scientists and other people are just not ready yet. Yeah. So you know, it, it's just like a guy that says, you know, I, I'm, I'm logical. You know, I don't believe in that. Yeah. You know, it's that same thing. They're scientists. They've got beliefs. And because they have yeah. beliefs, they don't believe in that. And yeah. their belief is like they're true believers about materialism, just like, you know, any any religious person who's a, you know, fundamentalist, true believer. There's not any difference. Beliefs are beliefs. They they limit you. So. Yeah. You can find scientists that will help you, and they will do it. But mostly, it's not good for their own careers. They learn something about science, too. It's the really good scientists who are willing to say, yeah, let's go experiment. But then they realize that the rest of the scientists won't come along very easily, and they won't like it. But once we find out the that the physicists tell us the virtual reality is a real thing and that it's scientific, 
suddenly a whole lot of minds will be opened because now all of those things that weren't possible anymore because they violated materialism, they don't have that reason anymore. Violating materialism now is a, is a fact. Materialism isn't the thing, you know. So that guy that says, well, I'm logical, I don't believe that. He'll have scientific logic that says, you know, we're a subset of something bigger, and that bigger thing is non-physical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. so don't don't pester me about non-physical stuff not being not being real, you know. The yeah. fact that we're here is because of non-physical stuff. So it'll just change a lot when when we when we get to that point. Yeah, for me, it's not that much the scientists that bother me. I, I am completely comfortable with their rejection and their denial and their fear. What I was surprised, however, was uh, I had a talk with a couple of remote viewers in one Facebook group, and I was surprised that they rejected us. <laughs> Yeah, it's, they said you don't have any scientific proof. It's all a scam. Yeah, yes, I was disappointed to be honest. Yes, well, you know, you tend to think that people who have opened their mind in one direction that that opens it in other directions yeah, too. It's not true. necessarily true. It's yeah. only open to just the thing they do, and yeah. they're very proud of their proof and so on. You know, and and anybody else wants to join their club, they got to have the same kind of you know, and it's, yeah, just because somebody's open in one idea, you know, beliefs are funny. You can have hundreds of beliefs and you can get rid of 50 of those beliefs, but those other ones still just stand up strong. And that's because beliefs are not rational. Yeah. You see, if it, if it was, if they were rational, they'd say, oh, well, if I can see without my eyes, then, you know, see a picture without my eyes. Why couldn't somebody else read a book without their eyes? Yeah. Why not? You see, but that would be rational. Yeah, exactly. But beliefs are not rational. Beliefs are just seeing, reading a book without your eyes. Ah, bullshit. Never happened. Yeah. You, know, you guys are just scammers. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. no, just because somebody's gotten rid of one belief doesn't mean they don't have a whole lot more still packed right in there. And mm -hmm. if you say, well, but, but it's so irrational for them to see pictures without eyes, but you can't read a book without eyes yeah. that's just so irrational to come to be there certainly they would understand but no yeah no, beliefs are not rational yeah that was a surprise and disappointment <laughs> for me and, yeah. a good lesson, and a good lesson indeed yeah yeah <laughs> well okay gonna go so long guys thanks it's been really been a lot of fun thank we you need to, Have a we nice need to stay we need to stay in touch Yep. Hopefully. Thank you. Until <laughs> next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.